Um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. John O'Bacon, recently appointed Director of Community at GitHub, um, former Community Manager at Canonical, and author of the best-selling The Art of Community, Mr. John O'Bacon. Thank you. How's everyone doing? <laughs> really? I know it was a late night last night, but come on, we can do better than that. How's everyone doing? That's more like it. So first of all, I want to say a big thank you to LCA for inviting me to come out and speak. Um, this has just been a thrill being at LCA, and just the generosity and the hospitality of the, of the organizing staff has just been tremendous. So please give them a big round of applause for treating the speakers so well. So, uh, I don't know a lot of you in this room, um, so there's a tiny bit of background, um, as was already mentioned, I joined GitHub recently as Director of Community, and I used to work at, at Canonical, uh, helping to lead the Ubuntu community. Um, I'm really passionate about community management and leadership, and how we build strong and effective communities, and I wrote a book called The Art of Community, and it's founded the Community Leadership Summit. And my theory here is that the only way in which we can build strong communities is to do it together. And this is fundamentally what this presentation is all about. It's about an opportunity. And it's an opportunity that every single one of you in this room can play an important role in. But to start this story, we have to go back in time a little bit to a more unfortunate era. When I was about 18 years old, I looked like this. Yeah! <laughs> Hair did once grow on this head, I assure you. And then it grew inwards and came out my toes. Um, when I was about 18 or 19 years old, I got interested in Linux and open source. My brother stayed with me for a couple of weeks, uh, installed Slackware 96 on my computer, left and put the login details on my, on my screen on a post-it note. So it was a fairly abrupt introduction to Linux and open source. And um, back then, like many of you, I got connected on something that looked a little bit like this, one of these big old bulky beige computers. Um, that's not actually running DOS from what I can tell, so don't zoom too close into that. But what was tremendously empowering about this time was that that computer gave me access to a whole world that was new to me. I was an 18, 19 year old kid living in southern England with a stupid haircut. And, uh, and as far as I was concerned, I didn't have the ability to have much of an impact in the world. I'd always had a desire to make a bigger difference in, in, in the world, but I was, there was no way for me to do that. I was limited by the scope of my local community. Getting this computer and getting Linux and getting connected to this global collaborative world was incredibly empowering, and it changed the course of my life, and I know it changed the course of many people's lives in here as well. But what was interesting about this time was that community was really at the beginning. We'd, we'd just started seeing people kind of getting together and building interesting things. And this is what I refer to as Community 1.0. This was the very early days of how we tended to do things. I mean, we can go all the way back to like the mid-80s, uh, where people at MIT were building, were building software, but in terms of how we were starting to see this forming across the world, this was the very early days. And the spearhead of this was arguably Linux. Um, how many of you were using Linux back in 1998, 1999? A lot of you, right? So many of you, this will feel very familiar to you. Around that era of, of Community 1.0, I think there were some fundamental elements that were present there. The first thing is that it was fundamentally observational. The way in which we learned communities was just by watching what other people did um, and learning from them. Linus Torvalds never set out to be a, a community manager or a community leader. He wanted to build a kernel. But the way in which he put together that community and, and structured it in different ways, he kind of just picked up from what other people were doing and what some of the contributors were saying would be useful and, and this, that, and the other. So it was very kind of like laissez-faire, kind of a bit random in how people were learning how to build communities. The second thing is that it was organic is that people would just say, I've got the cool idea for a free software and open source project, I'll just work on it. There was no like, big structured formalized effort, you know, by and large, back in those days. It was just, I've got a cool idea for a project, I'll start working on it. So it's a very organic environment, which made it a little difficult to find interesting projects that you wanted to work on. The other thing is that it was really technical. You know, if you didn't know C, then you basically couldn't participate in a lot of these communities. Um, and when I got involved, I knew a bit of C, but I was not, by any definition, the kind of person who could contribute to the Linux kernel. So it was a very technical environment. Even if you wanted to build document, if you, if you wanted to write documentation, you had to know LaTeX, which is basically programming as well. So it was a very technical environment, which meant that a lot of people couldn't, couldn't get involved in it. And then we started moving forward to what I would describe as Community 2.0. Right? This was the, 
This is when we started seeing community really starting to take off and open, start, uh, open source starting to take off. And I tend to think of this in the days of sort of 2004, 2005 sort of time. And we saw many examples of that across the years. You know, Jimmy Wales set out with this ambitious goal of documenting the world's knowledge into Wikipedia. And now that site is valued by the Smithsonian at tens of billions of dollars. You know, it's, it's changed how people learn. And it's, it's just a tremendous project. We've seen Red Hat recently valued at two, a two billion dollar uh, open source company, the first company to hit a billion dollars. Phenomenal success, all based around open source and free software. OpenStack has democratized the cloud in many different ways. And of course, GitHub has become the place where people, it's, it's the lingua franca for how people build technology and how people build code together. And there were, of course, some principles within Community 2.0 that pertain to that part of the history as well, some, some commonalities and some, some, some common threads in how we started building communities at the beginning of that era as well. The first thing is that we experienced what I've been calling for about five or six years now, a community management renaissance. And you know, the renaissance was a period of time in history where essentially the medieval ages got connected to the modern era. And what it was was it was an era in which people were writing things down, where they were learning repeatable best practice, where you, you could go and learn how to be a mathematician, how to be a scientist, um, as opposed to just observational elements like we saw with Community 1.0. So we started writing things down. I wrote my book, The Art of Community, which is just one way of doing things. It's not the only way. And there's lots of documentation around how you can do that. So that meant that people who were new to this, who didn't have the benefit of the hindsight of learning Previously, they could actually start from a position of, uh, of, of an informed perspective. We also started seeing self-organizing groups, people getting together to actually encourage other people to build open source and free software. Groups such as GNOME and KDE, the Linux Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, the Apache Foundation, all of these different groups getting together to spearhead the, the creation and the formation of new technology and new community. So we started seeing a growth in this movement moving forward. The other thing as well is that we started focusing much, much more on diversity. And you know, diversity is always a hot topic at the conferences, and we often talk about diversity within the realm of, of gender and sexuality and things such as that, which is obviously very important. But not only, I think, did we see in Community 2.0 an increased focus on that kind of diversity, but also the diversity of skills as well. You know, back in the early days of Community, it was very technical. In 2.0, we started seeing people doing documentation and translations and advocacy and other bits and pieces. So those people who weren't phenomenally technical actually had a seat at the table in which they could participate and play a role in this. Um, and then the other thing which I thought was particularly exciting, you know, and I think this really kicked in in sort of 2008, 2009 time, was companies getting engaged in community as well. Companies were saying, we identify that community is important, that it's relevant, that it serves our business as well, we're going to start focusing on this, hiring people to do this, and bringing them in. And this is a very different dynamic, because at that point you're connecting an internal company culture to an external culture that might be quite different, and there's a lot of nuance in how those two bits fit together. Um, this also opened up a, a period in which there were some people sadly would go to companies and that didn't really get community and they'd have a tough time, because navigating that culture would be difficult. So, this has become more and more of a focus of community management and leadership. So this all begs the question, what is 3.0 going to look like? What do we want the community of the future to be? And I've spent my career, just as one person you know, in our wider community, focusing on how do we build effective reproducible communities for everybody to benefit from. But it does that beg the question, why? Why do we care? Who cares about communities? Like, why is this important to us? I know that I'm, this is not the audience to ask that question to, because you all understand the benefit of this. But in my mind, the real reason why we should be doing this is that thoughtful and productive communities make us as a species better. I'm firmly of the belief that we as a human race are not working our maximum efficiency in terms of how we collaborate together. And the reason for that is because the communities that we're building today are primarily architected by people who kind of know what they're doing. And I don't think most people in the world know how to build communities. And as I'll get to later on, it's quite complicated. So there are lots of people out there who can do the great work within a community that aren't equipped with the tools and the knowledge they need to successfully set up their own communities. When we bridge that gap, we by definition make us as people, as human beings, more efficient. We innovate better. We create a more diverse and a better and a happier planet. And that's the reason why I think this is really important. So, as I mentioned earlier on, back in the earlier days, I had one of these, right? One of these computers. And the thing that was 
remarkable about that was it was I could download software that I could work on, that I, I could hack on, and it was connected to the internet. Those primitive benefits opened up a whole world of exploration for me as just one person. But we should first look at the era that we live in today and how community might map to this. So first of all, we've seen a tremendous growth in, in uh, computing power. The graph on the left up here, I know it's a little bit fuzzy, but it shows the, the growth of computing power over the years. This is basically Moore's law. If you follow this growth curve, in 2025, a $1,000 computer will be as powerful as a human brain. Just think about the application for big data, for artificial intelligence, for machine learning, having that kind of power at your disposal. Just go and talk to Keith Packard from HP about the work that they're doing on the machine as a good example of how we're escalating computing power. The graph on the right shows the growth of internet access, because horsepower is, they just fist bump, that was awesome. <laughs> HP fist bump. Um, the graph on the right shows the, the growth of, of internet access across the world. Um, and this is not just people in Western countries getting faster and faster internet connections. This is people in countries that have never been connected before, being able to get connected. So it's not just horsepower, it's the access as well. But these people are not getting connected through their traditional big bulky desktop computers. They're typically getting connected today through smartphones. And this graph here shows the growth of smartphone usage across the world. So what we're seeing here is power is becoming ubiquitous, access is becoming ubiquitous, and the device usage that we're using is varying. And this is all things we should consider in how we build the next generation of community. But what's interesting here as well is that <clears throat> the palette, the, the, the range of tools and textures that people have got to play with in building innovative things today is varied as well. It's very different to when I got started and how many of you folks got started. Today we have things such as um, cheap computing, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis. Um, we've got things such as 3D printing, the democratization of manufacturing. We're seeing a growth in drones. We're conquering the sky. In, in a repeatable manner. Um, we've also seen, of course, the massive growth of open source, not just for building interesting applications, but frameworks and compilers and people taking the open source methodology and applying it to businesses. We've seen the ubiquitous growth of the cloud. So if you stick an Arduino into a 3D printed case, you connect it to a drone, you run open source software on there, and you run out of horsepower, you've got an endless amount of horsepower for, 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 for powering what you want to do computationally, as well as data process, processing and other things in the cloud. And what really excites me is that for many years, people have been innovating in different ways. They've been sitting in garages, building interesting and exciting things, and there's always been a gap in getting that thing out to consumers. And crowdfunding has provided one method of bridging that gap, where the public become the venture capitalist. And we start seeing just tremendous projects being able to come out to the surface that are often the form formation of new businesses as well. So this is an incredible era for us to be in, with the horsepower, with the internet access, with the range of tools that we've got at our disposal. And what this is resulting in, in my mind, is hundreds of millions of new minds getting connected into a global conversation, empowered by the opportunity to build interesting things. This isn't just about building cool technology that makes the world a better place. This is about building things that empowers those people to have better lives, to feel collaborative and to feel engaged. You know, I think one thing that we often forget when we come to Linux conferences is the fact that we've discovered this world is such an incredible privilege for everybody, but we're surrounded by such collaborative, fun, engaging, and creative people. And there's many people out there that haven't experienced that world yet, and they're getting into that. So, I think that one of the things in my mind for Community 3.0 is the first thing that we need to focus on is we need to empower diversity, not just in people, you know, things such as gender and sexuality and socioeconomic class and those attributes, but also in terms of talent. We need to open up a world in which not just programmers, but artists and designers and documentation writers and activists can all work together and, and make a difference in how they can they make interesting things. <laughs> What's also exciting to me is that we are fundamentally, as humans, pretty linear creatures. You know, our brain up here hasn't had a hardware upgrade in quite a long time. And we're using the same hardware as we were using hundreds of thousands of years ago, where the main challenges that we were dealing with was finding food, and is that a tiger in the bush? Is it going to eat me? And today we're using the same hardware where we have this massive knowledge of the world and all these intricacies of how things fit together and and social dynamics and all these different pieces. Um, so typically as humans, I think we tend to think in fairly linear ways. This is something I learned a lot from my old, from my old boss at XPRIZE, is 
you know, we tend to think in a fairly linear way. But when we know, for example, that computing power is going to be, you know, as powerful as a human brain in 2025, when we know what the ubiquitous internet growth uh, is going to look like, when we know we've got these technologies that are at our disposal, we can think much bigger. And what we can basically set out with is really bold and audacious goals. That we're not just trying to fix what's immediately close to us, that we're actually going out and saying, how could we really make a difference? And it's people like Elon Musk, I think, make a, are a good example of this. You just go out there and say, let's do it. You know, um, Jimmy Wales with Wikipedia had a similar kind of process. Why don't we document the planet? It's a pretty audacious goal. So, but what's, what's exciting to me is that when you look at this litany of technologies that I talked about earlier on, openness is at the heart of all of them. You know, when you see people building interesting things with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, um, they're building projects invariably that have an open source component. Many of the crowdfunding campaigns that we see have an open source component. Um, the cloud uh, is powered by open source. Um, we've got a strong sense of openness. It might not necessarily be specifically Linux, but the principles of openness and collaboration are flowing through modern technology choices today. Kids who are growing up and learning technology are expecting openness to be a part of that, which is something I've been talking to companies about. You have to grow up and you have to be open so your next generation of staff uh, are, are getting what they expect. And that, as such, we're starting to see really fascinating examples of this kind of innovation. This uh, thing on the left is called the 3D Robotics uh, Solo Drone. This is a drone that's got two Linux computers in it. It's got an open SDK where you can write drone apps in Python. Um, it's just phenomenal. Open source, it's got bits of open hardware in, it, hardware in it. And this is basically, as far as I'm concerned, it's like the general purpose computer of the sky. Um, the one on the right is the Mycroft AI, which I'm serving as an advisor for, which is basically an open source equivalent to the Amazon Echo. And, you know, in a world where we're so worried about AI, and so many people are concerned about AI, we, as the people, should be taking control of that, not a company taking control of that. And this is a good step in that direction. Completely open source, completely open hardware, completely open services. So, I think the second lesson for us to, to explore here is that we need to build a bridge between atoms and bits. Back in Community 1.0 and 2.0, it was all software. And now we live in a world where there's 3D printed cases, where there is hardware components. How do we do that? How do we build communities around those shared bits and pieces? I think the good news here is that, and I've been saying this for years, is that open source really is where society innovates. This is, we figured out how to work collaboratively in open source and free software. How do you coordinate many people working together on code? How do you do code review? How do you manage bugs? How do you set up quality infrastructure? We figured all that kind of stuff out significantly in the open source world. And I'm confident that the open source world will provide many of the answers that we're looking for towards these questions. But at the heart of everything we've been talking about in open source is collaboration. And we talk about this at every single conference. Why collaboration is important. Different methodologies of doing collaboration in different ways. Is Donna Benjamin in here? Yes. Yeah, there she is. Donna is one of my favorite people because she put together, we do a community leadership summit every, every year in the US, and we've started doing local ones. And Donna's done one for the last couple of years over here, CLSX at LCA. And that day was talking about collaboration and making us more efficient and making it more fulfilling and thoughtful in different ways. And collaboration is an important thing for us to focus on, but in my mind, the real thing we need to crack here is predictable collaboration. It's a world in which you don't need a community manager as an expert to build communities, in which communities become more general purpose. And in that way, that's why I believe that we need to make great community leadership accessible to everybody. You shouldn't have to have an expert in your company, in your project, to know how to put things together. We should be converting that knowledge into an addressable format that everybody can use. My old boss, uh, Peter at XPRIZE, once said to me, it's not about having all of the answers, it's about knowing how to package up the right answers in a consumable format. And I think that's really important. So in a nutshell, we can do better. A lot better. And I think we should all feel a great sense of accomplishment of how far we've got with, with open source and free software. We're only just scratching the surface. You know, everyone in this room is going to play a role in leaving a legacy that is going to far, go far beyond what we've already accomplished today. And this is really a significant chunk of the focus of the work that I'm working on at GitHub. Is, in my mind, GitHub provides an incredible opportunity where people are building technology in GitHub to empower those people to build really strong and effective communities. Um, 
and that work will be, will be done, that work will be ultimately exposed as part of the work that we do at GitHub. But in finding the answers to those questions, this is way more than GitHub. You know, we'll provide that as something that's useful to GitHub users, but this is information that should be useful to everybody, not just the people who use GitHub as well. Um, it begs the question, though, how? You know, I've basically laid out what I think we need to do. How, how on earth do we do this? How do we get started? Well, I think the first thing we need to accept is that this is not just about technology. Like, most of us in this room are pretty heavy technology users. We talk about tools and software and, and hardware and, and things that those things can do for us that are interesting and exciting. But when, I think when you take away the screens and the lights and the cell phones and the, the seats and all of these banners and that laptop, when you remove all of this stuff, I think we sometimes forget that we're just human beings. You know? We're animals. And we have a fairly consistent set of motivations, worries, things that we're excited about. And we shouldn't remove the humanity from the consideration of how we build great communities, because it's about humanity in many different ways. And I believe that everyone in this room, and everyone outside of this room, everyone who's watching this on the stream, Everyone wants to live a life of dignity. And if you live a life of dignity, to get that, essentially what you need is to feel a sense of self-respect, a sense of self-worth. If you love yourself, you'll invariably feel a sense of dignity. But to feel that sense of self-respect and self-worth, invariably we feel like we need to be able to contribute, to be able to play a role in something, in our, in our relationships, in our companies, in our communities, in our families. But to be able to contribute, we need access. And I think that is the thing that we've seen come to the forefront of Community 2.0, is that we've, we've had access. One of the most beautiful examples that I've ever seen of this in action was an email that I got when I just joined Canonical from a, a boy who lived out in Africa. This is not him, this is just to illustrate, illustrate this. Um, I wish I had a picture of him, because I'd love to have seen, seen who he was. But he sent me an email and he said, I love Ubuntu, and I love the spirit and the focus and, and the humanity that's going into Ubuntu. Uh, and he told me a story about how he'd work all week in his village, lived in a rural village, um, to earn some money. And then at the weekend, on Saturday, he'd basically walk two hours into the local town. He'd spend his money on an hour's worth of internet access, which is what he could afford, and he'd contribute to Ubuntu. And then he'd walk two hours back. You know, the level of passion that he had about Ubuntu, and you could replace Ubuntu with Fedora or any other project, it, it drove him enough to put that level of investment of time and energy into doing that. And at that point, when I got that email, I realized my role as a community manager or as trying to drive this movement forward is to help him to get the most out of his hour. So he feels fulfilled and he feels productive and he feels a sense of belonging in that contribution that he made. There are hundreds of thousands of stories like this around the world that we have no idea about. And I think focusing on this is, is helping us to bring those stories to the surface. So I think I'm a big believer in start zooming out and then zooming into, the, into the, the more specifics. So I think the first thing we need to explore is the different types of value that we want to focus on that we drive in community. And I would divide them up into two areas, tangible value and intangible value. So tangible value is the stuff that you can measure. It's installing GitHub Enterprise. It's installing... Uh, various tools and methodologies for what, how you're going to build technology. You can track it, you can look at the logs, you can look at the metrics, and you can use those logs and metrics to determine whether that thing's working effectively for you. That's what tangible value is. And tangible value is handy because you can count it. And if the, if the numbers don't look right, you can drive the numbers in different directions by influencing different things. Um, and we tend to spend a lot of time at conferences talking about tangible value. We're, we're comparing <coughs> source control systems and bug tracking systems and whatever else. But that to me is not the hard bit. The hard bit is the intangible value. And that is the relationships, trust, respect, dignity. The things that are important to us as human beings. And part of the challenge here is that one of the things that I've been getting increasingly frustrated about in the world as I get older, is that the world is architected through the eyes of an economist. And economists want to put things into spreadsheets. I don't really like spreadsheets. And I don't like the things in the spreadsheets. And when you're trying to take natural phenomena and trying to convert that into a metric that you can track in a spreadsheet, you usually don't get good results. 
Um, and the reason why I don't particularly like this is because these kinds of economists think that people are pretty rational, that we, we operate like machines. In reality, we're hugely irrational. Every single one of you in this room is massively irrational. Um, we, we don't make wise decisions. If everybody made wise decisions, we'd all have savings. We'd all be thin and slender and exercise weekly and eat really healthy food. We wouldn't do drugs. There's all manner of things that we tend to do because we make irrational choices. And that's because human beings are animals. What's interesting is that we're irrational in fairly predictable ways. Is that the, the, you can actually see commonality in that irrationality. Uh, a good example of this is science has proven that if you go to dinner with your friends, you will eat more food than if you stay at home and have dinner by yourself. Because you're in a, in a social setting, you think, you know what, I'm having fun, yeah, I'll have an extra helping of chicken wings. Um, you know, I'll start the diet tomorrow. We tend to make those kinds of decisions. Um, and that's an irrational choice. Like, we should be thinking, oh, well, in the interest of my health and my well-being, I should probably not have that extra helping of chicken wings. So we're fairly... Our rationality is fairly predictable in different ways. And this is fundamentally the study of behavioral ec economics. My best friend, Stuart Language, got me in interested in this a couple of years ago. And what was exciting to me about this is that it basically provides a scaffolding on how we can understand that intangible element of people. Um, and when we understand that, we can then build tools and processes and everything else to make more fulfilling, more effective communities. So for those of you who are new to this, I'm going to give you a very quick prime on what behavioral economics is. Pretty much most of us have got one of these in our heads. <laughs> is that a chocolate brain? <laughs> chocolate brain. <laughs> you should never reward that, by the way. <laughs> this is bad behavior to reward, me singing chocolate brain. So we've all got a brain. And um, there's a, a wonderful author called Daniel Kahneman, and he proposes that we have two types of thinking, okay? So we've got... The first type of thinking is called System 1 thinking. Um, system 1 thinking is essentially just immediate gut reactions, like primitive, just, you just do it. You don't think about it, it's just a subconscious, you just, you just do it. So, uh, I'll give you an example. What's, sir, what's your name? Grant. Grant? So, if I said to Grant, Grant, what's 1 plus 1? You'd just say 2. It just immediately pops out your head. You don't think anything of it. That's system one thinking. System two thinking is the notion that you, you really think and you consider it and you consciously assess things. So if I said to Grant, I'm going to give you $30,000, you can go out and buy a car with it. You'd be thinking, okay, which models should I assess? What's the safety record? What options can I get? You know, you'd assess all these things and you'd spend some time and eventually come to a conclusion, but there'd be a certain amount of decision paralysis in how that works. Uh, there's a wonderful speaker, TED speaker, called Rory Sutherland, who once said uh, that, the, that System 2 is kind of like the White House press office making excuses for what the president does, which is System 1 thinking. <laughs> and this is how our brains work, is that in reality, a lot of the core reason why we react to different situations in different ways is because of that just built-in, just gut, primeval, thousands of years brewed into our brains kind of System 1 thinking. So if we really understand what that, how that system one operates, and if it is predictably irrational in different ways, it sheds a light on ways in which we can identify methods of kind of harnessing those things to build stronger communities. The problem with behavioral economics, and when you, if some of you are going to go away and look this up, is that it's really fascinating to read, but it's very difficult to apply it in real life. And um, what you have to do is you have to find, you have to look for the principles in behavioral economics writing and pull those principles out. Um, and then apply them to the work that you're doing. But there is one person, this guy called Dr. David Rock, um, who is a neuroscientist, and he performed a really interesting study that I think is a good introduction to how we can start thinking about how we build great communities. He basically did a ton of ethical research in animals. And in doing this research, he identified through various social testing that um, animals just have a certain set of core principles that are in system one thinking. Just things that happen to most of us, that are important to most of us. And he posits that these apply to human beings as well. He calls this the SCARF model. Uh, it's, you can go and download the PDF of this. It's a little heavy, like most academic papers are, but it's a really fascinating read. And it doesn't just apply to communities, it can apply to how you work and your families and other things as well. I'm going to walk through this real quick. So the S in the SCARF model is status. 
As human beings, status is really important to us. There are people who will say that they don't care about status. Those people are not really being very frank with you. We all care about status. Just look at LCA. There's already some clear status roles. There are attendees and speakers, the speakers and keynote speakers. There are the organization staff and attendees. You've got people who've come to LCA for 10 years, and then people who've come here for the first year. All of these play a slightly different role in how we engage and interact with people and how confident people feel. So one of the things that we can do here is we can think of the status types in our communities and identify ways in which people can flow through them. The problem is when you join at a particular status level and there's no way in which you can flow to other status levels. That's when people get frustrated. So this is something, knowing that status is important to people is a good, is a good first step. The C in SCARF is certainty. We don't like uncertainty as humans. Think about those times when you're not sure if, uh, if your boss thinks that you're doing a good job. Think about those times when you're worried about the, uh, the political climate where you live, where you're worried if your spouse is happy with you, if your kids are happy with you. you know, think about all those times when you feel that sense of uncertainty. It causes stress. It causes anxiety. And stress and anxiety can cause people to behave in ways that they wouldn't ordinarily want to behave. So if we can reduce levels of uncertainty, in communities. It makes people feel more comfortable. I think this is particularly important for communities that have a company attached to it. Because when you've got a company, the people who work for that company always have more information than anybody in the community. That's just the nature of the beast. And <clears throat> it's important to provide certainty around what that company is doing as best as you can, because sometimes when people don't have the answers, they make them up in their own heads, and that can cause uncertainty and stress and anxiety. The A is autonomy. One of the things that Dr. David Rock identified is that as humans, we absolutely want choices. If you're pushed into a situation and you have no choices, you don't feel a sense of control and therefore it feels frustrating. And what's interesting is that you can create choices that ultimately all lead to the same conclusion. And this is what's known as choice architecture. So for example, you know, we were talking to, to Grant earlier on, if Grant goes and buys the car, um, you can choose, you know, colors and uh, tire options and body shapes and all this kind of stuff. Fundamentally, the money's all still going to Ford or BMW, whoever. But the act of being able to choose and customize that thing feels really rewarding. Think about how at Linux conferences, we love configurable software. The very first principle of Unix was the fact that you could plug it together in different ways. And we love that. That's why we got involved in that. And that's, pretty, that's a pretty exciting consideration that we should factor into our communities as well. The R is known as relatedness, and relatedness is essentially saying that while status is important, social groupings are important as well. And this is about identifying different groups that you will, that you will see within specific communities. So, for example, in the Ubuntu community, we'd have like our core developers, our Motu developers who would work on Universe, like the Deb essentially the long tail of the Debian archive, documentation writers, translators. If you're a single person and you walk into a massive group of people but on your own, um, it, it's unnerving, it's scary because the scope is huge, but when you join a specific small group that you've got a, a connection with, it's easier to kind of get a sense of the culture, to feel like you've met like-minded people and to, and, to, and to bring yourself into that particular community. So relatedness is very important as well. The final one, which I thought was the most interesting one in his study, is fairness. And this is not just the fact that we all wanted to be fair, uh, 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 treated fairly ourselves, is that we don't like it when other people get treated unfairly. So we talk a lot at conferences about diversity. I'm a heterosexual white man. I am the living embodiment of what privilege means. And so for me to go into a community, I generally get treated fairly in most kids' situations. And I'm, I like the fact that I'm treated fairly, just from a selfish perspective, but I also really don't like it when I see uh, my friends and, and associates in, in the community who are uh, underrepresented groups who are treated unfairly as well. And that's a core principle in how we as humans work. So fairness is not just important in the individual, but also making sure that it's more ubiquitous throughout the rest of the group. So these five components in SCARF, I think, are a really great opportunity just to just provide some structure on how we can start building communities. So at that point, we're starting to figure out what the people element is. Now we actually need to convert this into stuff that we can actually do. And this fundamentally boils down to experiences and choice. And before I go into this, I want to share two golden rules that I've learned over the course of my career that I think are really helpful 
to share because they apply to not just how we build Community 3.0, but also how we build uh, great relationships in companies with our families and elsewhere. The first golden rule is that we accomplish our goals indirectly. If you have a big goal and you just go running straight at it like a bull in a china shop, you will be less successful invariably than if you explore the different ways in which you can influence that outcome. The example here is Boeing. Boeing make great aeroplanes, and their primary mission statement was to make great aeroplanes many years ago, and they made great aeroplanes. Then they had kind of a strategic change in the company, and their, their primary focus changed to delivering shareholder value. And consequently, they stopped making great aeroplanes, because they were so focused on delivering great shareholder value. So they switched the focus back to making great aeroplanes, and the side effect of that was great shareholder value. Right? And that principle, I think, can apply in lots of different situations. The second element here is that we influence behavior with lots of small actions. The biggest, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The worst offender here of doing this are governments. Governments will say, we have a problem in our society, drugs, childhood obesity. Here is the $200 billion, you know, whatever it is, kind of campaign to stop this. Whereas in reality, and this will probably resonate with a lot of you, the way in which we really kind of make a difference in the world is lots of small aggregated actions that lead up to something big. A good example of this was um, there's been an issue with childhood obesity in America for a long time and there was a, a, a lady who was a principal of a school and she wanted to make a difference in this. So instead of trying to set up this massive big campaign or big project, what she did is she went and talked to her lunch staff and she asked them to lay the food out differently. So all the healthier stuff was at the front of the line, it was better lit, it looked more appetizing. All the un unhealthier stuff was kind of held back a little bit, it was at the end of the line so the kids would fill their trays up first. Consequently, when they counted it, most kids picked the healthier stuff. A very small action that resulted in something that was ubiquitous in terms of headness in the right direction. There's a great book by this guy called Richard Thaler called Nudge that you should read if you want to check, check into that theory or that, that philosophy more. So with these two golden rules, I think that what community is all about is building experiences. And a good example of this is when you go to the doctors. You go to the doctor's office and, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of, there's a, a set of, there's a decision tree about how that happens. Uh, you show up, where do you park your car? Do you have to go in and fill a form in first? Is a nurse going to take you and take your blood pressure, your weight, um, your height, and all that kind of stuff? Or, and then see a doctor, or maybe you see the doctor first. Um, how is the information going to be you know, documented in the system? What does the room look like in which you're sitting in? All of these small considerations. And you can basically map a lot of these things down to a flowchart. You can basically say, given the optimal experience of how I want to build a doctor's surgery or how I want to build a community, what would that experience look like? And I think it's, this is where we get into how we build Community 3.0. Is it's about building really comprehensive experiences that feel rewarding to people. Because when anybody goes to a great experience, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's going to a gig, whether it's um, seeing a friend, whether it's going to see a show, whatever it might be, when you experience what feels like a good, sleek, fulfilling experience, it's incredibly rewarding. When we can do that effectively in communities, we start hitting Community 3.0. Now, I believe that this is broken into two layers. The first layer is what I call community workflow. Now, this is just an illustration um, of what I think this could look like. But this is basically the different considerations that go into how people build communities, from how do you have ideas, how do the good ideas bubble up to the surface. Um, you've got communication. All kinds of things about communication. Do we use mailing lists, IRC, Slack? How do you organize meetings? How do you track meeting notes? How do you ensure good conduct in communication? How do you plan your work? Do you have formal planning where you define work items and burn them down with a burn down chart? Or do you have like cadence planning where you use Trello or Waffle or something like that? Uh, or do you just allow people to throw things over the fence so you don't have any formalized planning? You've then got development. How do we actually build software? What tools, what frameworks do we use? What do we use? What's our code of conduct? Uh, what's our um, what's our, request, uh, our requirements around code quality? Then we've got things such as, uh, uh, such as QA itself more directly, which is how do we do automated testing? How do we unit testing? How do we do smoke testing? You know, how do we get QA issues fixed and feed them into the development pipeline? How do we ship? You know, what's our release cadence? Do we have a release cadence? Do we release every six months like Debian or, or uh, sorry, like Ubuntu or Fedora, or do we release less often? Um, how do we support those releases? Do we break them off into a diverged paths and you have long-term releases and short-term releases? 
How do you participate? This is the thing that I think we typically talk about most in communities. How do we get people excited and involved? That's just, to me, one small piece of it. Do you bring people in through Google Hangouts, through Twitter, through hackathons, through various other methods? And then, of course, how do we govern? How do you lead communities effectively? Do you have a dictatorial method of, uh, of leadership, such as Linux? Or do you have a delegated governance method, such as Debian or Ubuntu? Or do you have an enlightened method, such as KDE? There's so many different considerations. And I think part of the reason why so many projects don't build successful communities is putting that in place is really hard. It requires a, a pretty strong breadth of knowledge, and we need to make that easier for people. But sadly, that's not the only bit. I think there is, that's just the first level. The second level is that imagine if I took that workflow and I drew that on this stage as a map. There's going to be different experiences in how somebody goes and traverses through that workflow. So here's a couple of examples. You could have new developers. New developers, when they join, they don't have any context. They don't really have the relationships. And it's terrifying. You know, how many of you have joined an open source project in the last six months? Yeah, a couple of you? And I'm pretty sure you found it pretty unnerving. You know, you join, you don't really know the people. You're expected to contribute something out in the open, you know, where everybody's going to be assessing and potentially being quite critical of you. You really wear your heart on the sleeve when you join an open source project. So for new developers, the way in which they traverse that kind of roadmap, that, that workflow, is going to be quite different to core developers who are doing a very similar thing over and over again. They're repeating, they're, they're writing, you know, having ideas, writing code, and implementing code. And like anything that you repeat over and over again, when you have little rough edges that stick out the side, they scuff on you over and over again. It becomes really annoying. So we need to make sure that for core developers, that process is really sleek and efficient and effective. Um, we then have, for example, consumers. How do people who, con who consume the output of that particular community use it? How do they feed back in with support and bugs and things like that? What about downstream consumers? People who take the output of your community and that's the basis for another community. You know, for example, Debian is the basis of Ubuntu. You know, we'd ha a good example of that was somebody has a bug in Ubuntu. Do they file it in the Ubuntu bug tracker? Do they file it in the Debian bug tracker? How do we sync those status points between this, th those two? That's just one topic that you could write books about. And then organizations. The way in which you navigate that workflow for a kind of hardcore enterprise window shop is going to be very different to a hardcore Ruby on Rails San Francisco web developer. You know, these are very different cultures, so that even though you've got the same principles in place, the way in which we navigate those different workflow elements varies. So as one tiny example, uh, first of all, with new developers, one of the things that I've been talking about for years is what I call the on-ramp, which is if you're on the bottom left-hand side of this triangle, how do we... You're brand new, and, ha, and if you get to the top right-hand side of the triangle, you've done something of value to the community. What do we need to make that experience fulfilling and successful for that user? Well, I think we need... You need to be able to discover the community first of all. You then need to develop the knowledge and the skills to be able to create something, and then also how to contribute it over to the community. You need to know how to get started. What should you work on? Do you work on an existing task? Do you just create something new that's of value, but you don't want someone to work on something that ultimately isn't going to be useful or rewarded by the community. How do you get help and support in a way that feels accessible and fulfilling? And then finally, how do you receive kudos and a sense of, of appreciation for, for not just contributing to the community, but sometimes also for questioning some of the basic principles of the community and thinking of new ways of doing it? That is very different, for example, to core developers who have this kind of cycle that I mentioned earlier on of creating code, doing QA, uh, maintaining that code, because core developers also do things like governance and mentorship and code review. Um, so these are all different, very different experiences for navigating a fairly consistent workflow and infrastructure that you might have in place. So as I bring this in to a conclusion, my view here is that for us to build a next generation of community that is diverse in people as well as talents, that bridges the gap between atoms and bits, um, that is something that is fundamentally fulfilling for people and that is reproducible so non-experts can set up effective communities. We need to first of all understand that system one and two thinking, how we, predictably, how we are predictably irrational in different ways as humans, to use that as a basis to then identify behavioral patterns that don't apply to everybody, but they apply to a lot of people. That can help influence how we direct and 
construct that workflow and then how we construct the experiences that navigate throughout that workflow. And when we can package that up in a way that feels accessible, reproducible, and fair to people, I believe that we will get to a point where we have Community 3.0. And the whole point of this, and I got back to, you know, earlier on in this, in this presentation, I mentioned that we're human. The one thing I've been saying for years since I wrote The Art of Community is that the most important thing that we deliver in any community is a sense of belonging. When you feel part of something, when you feel part of a group, and you feel like your contributions are appreciated, you don't have entitlement, but you feel part of something that's bigger than you, and you're enjoying that, you will stick around in that community for years. That's how you get people to join and stay in communities. Just think about those of you who've been to LCA regularly. You know, I've met people who've been for eight, ten years since I've been here. I'm sure a reason for that is because you feel a sense of belonging. When you show up at LCA, you're among friends. And that's just incredibly rewarding for people. But it's not just that, it's about opportunity as well. You know, I said at the beginning of this presentation, I believe that we are fundamentally inefficient as a human race when it comes to collaboration, and I stand by that. But I think to myself, you know, when I had that beige computer, and it was an internet connection, and it was a very early version of Linux, the impact that I, that had on my life, that had on my perspectives and on my, on my career has been profound. And if we get Community 3.0 right, and every single one of you in this room has got a jigsaw piece that you can put into that puzzle to help us do this, just think about the legacy we'll leave for people like him. That's my three-year-old son. And when I think about the world that he's going to grow up in and the opportunity that he's going to have, it's going to be an incredible legacy for all of us to leave. Thank you. Um, so we've received some questions. Um, thank you all for sending them in. Um, okay. Mind if we go through a couple? Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> so Adam Baxter has asked, do you have any ideas for increasing the signal-to-noise ratio in open source communities? Signal-to-noise ratio. <clears throat> I think it's a problem that we have. Um, I think part of the, ch the reason why it's a challenge that signal-to-noise is because the people who are generating the noise are usually doing it with great intentions. You know, they... There is a, a real distinction between people who are trolling, who are just being problematic, and people who are just not very deft in collaborating, so they generate a lot of noise, and people who are more deft at collaborating could get to the same point with fewer words and fewer interactions. I think that there's a few methods that we can use to, to tend to this. One is mentorship, is helping people to be more efficient and more effective in how they collaborate together. The second thing is, I think, is thinking about how we define reputation. Mm -hmm. Is um, one of the things that I've been exploring quite a lot in the last couple of months is what does good contribution really look like, and how can we synthesize that in a way that that can apply to lots of different communities? Like the problem with a lot of reputation systems is that they can be gamed, and they can shove people into one template of what a community is. And you know, there's lots of different types of community with lots of different driving forces. But I think. Having a community understand what the concept of what great contribution is, understanding what that is, can be a useful tool for when somebody is generating a lot of noise, is sitting down then with a friendly tone and saying, you know, this is what we'd like to get to, we believe in what you're doing, and here's some guidance for how we can get you to that point. Okay. Um, Paul Waper has asked, um, you talked a lot about technical communities, and we see sites like Stack Overflow uh, bridging technical and non-technical people. We also see many other communities online, from Reddit to 4chan and others, where we've seen things where people can be incredibly destructive um, to other human beings. Is there a bridge between technical ability and compassion? Or, in other words, how can we use our technical skills to bring more empathy and, and humanity to other communities? Good grief. It's <laughs> a £2.50 question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's so many layers to that. There, I'm a big believer in that leaders and communities need to set a great example. Mm -hmm. And um, there are people who don't like the notion of that, who don't like the notion of they, they just want to kind of operate in the way that they want to operate. And I don't think setting a great example means that you remove the individuality of people. Like, mm -hmm. I think you should, the thing that's most incredible about open source and free software, I think, is that people are themselves. You know, people can 
can go out uh, into a conference, can go out into, onto the internet and be themselves and do incredible work. But I think that fundamentally reducing that destructive influence is about setting a good example and making it very clear that you will not tolerate that. Yep. Uh, you, will, you won't tolerate um, abusive behavior towards other people. Is one, is that's the people component. I don't think we'll ever build tools that will effectively be able to completely remove destructive people. We will be able to remove uh, repe repeatable things like spam. So Akismet is a good example of that. But there's a lot of nuance in, for example, somebody who is very direct um, and kind of upfront, uh, but constructive. We should in in welcome those kinds of people, but there are people who are just outright destructive and rude and disrespectful. Mm -hmm. we, sh we shouldn't allow those. Software will never, ever be able to sufficiently determine between those different groups of people because there's so much culture and age and experience. But I think what tools can help us with is bringing the visibility of potential cases of like that to the surface. So I think systems can inform us of, here's a history of this particular person and what they're doing, so human beings can make a better decision about it. Okay. Um, that leads into a question that I myself wanted to ask. How do you feel that people like Linus, um, who have found themselves in a position of leadership almost by accident um, and through their own technical skill, um, which many feel they abuse and they abuse the members of their community that they lead, affect the reach of diversity and empowerment of those communities that they're leaders of? My view here is, without wanting to spe focus specifically on this, but I think it's a good example, is like many topics, I think you, you have two far sides of the, of the debate. <laughs> so in the Linus thing, you've got people who think that he is absolutely doing the right thing, is well within his rights, you know, the reason why Linux is successful is because of the way that he approaches the project. And then you've got other people who believe that this is absolutely phenomenally unacceptable and that we shouldn't tolerate any of that at all. Like everything, I think there is something in the middle. And with that particular case in particular, you know, when I said earlier on about leadership is about setting a good example, I think that should apply to Linux. Yep. You know, I think that's important. Um, and I think people who don't want that responsibility, then then that's part and parcel of being leadership, uh, be, be, uh, sorry, being a leader. However, I do think that sometimes people conflate very direct focused communication with um, abusive communication. And I think, again, the challenge here is that it's so nuanced, and I think so many different people define the lines in different ways, that there will never ever be a consistency of, of opinion on this. So my view is, you know, there's a lot kind of rolled up in the Linus example because, for example, you know, Linus will treat people who he's known for many years, who he can speak very freely and openly with, a very, in a specific way, and that could be seen as incredibly disrespectful. It's fine within the context of his relationship with that person, but it doesn't set a good example for the community. So I th my view is, like, in that particular example, I think Linus is an awesome, an awesome person, and, you know, I've known him for years and he's a great guy, but... I think kind of you need to dial it back a little bit um, and accept the fact that even though it might be okay within the parameters of that relationship, you know, perception is everything. And, and it does set a certain type of example um, that you don't necessarily want. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Do you mind? Oh, sorry. We've got a, <laughs> a few more questions. Um, do you mind if we send those through to you via email and uh, Happy to respond help. on the list? Yes. All right. Um, another round of applause for John O'Bacon. And is that as a token of our appreciation for you flying all the way over, um, I've got this gift for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.